Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Sherling. I'm the co-founder of Modernizing Medicine. I'm joined today with Dr. Drew Rosenthal, Director of Emma Plastic Surgery. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming on to learn more about our solution for revenue killers, which are looming in plastic surgery on the horizon and in medicine in general. Um, we're dedicated here to doing just what our name says, modernizing medicine. Um, we use technology you already own, uh, desktops, laptops, iPads, uh, and take the hard work you already do to make sure you get paid for what you do and provide unmatched intelligent documentation. Um, so, you know, we were created with the goal of leveraging technology to make a doctor-friendly solution for medical record keeping in an age of growing rules and regulations. And uh, the goal of this is today to explain a little bit about how those rules and regulations um, can actually turn into potential landmines into opportunities for you. So um, a little bit about me, um, uh, my name is Andrew Rosenthal, uh, I am the medical director of Emma Plastic Surgery. Uh, I re received my bachelor's at Duke and uh, my medical degree at Tulane. I did my plastic surgery training at University of Michigan. I've been in practice, uh, private practice in South Florida for uh, more than 10 years and I've been in uh, numerous different uh, practice situations so I understand these uh, different practice situations and how different uh, practices in plastic surgery differ. Currently, I'm about 70% cosmetic and about 30% reconstructive. Um, I also serve as a principal investigator on several FDA trials and a consultant for Nexus Medical doing uh, medical insurance and legal uh, reviews, so I understand this also from the insurance perspective. So the revenue killers that are looming out there are these. Uh, there's the uh, upcoming ICD-10, which was initially delayed and looks like it probably will not be delayed further and is going to be uh, coming uh, to you in October of this year. Uh, there's meaningful use, which we are uh, at stage two along the timeline, uh, as well as PQRS, uh, value-based modifiers related to this. Um, we're going to talk a little about the modifiers, the use of the 5.9 and 2.5 modifiers, which we use extensively, but um, you're going to have to stop using them or make sure you use them very, very intelligently or you're going to uh, uh, possibly get into some uh, trouble. Uh, also going to talk a little bit about medical necessity and how you need to document that and a little bit about the opportunity in telemedicine. So with all of these things sitting out there, we're sort of sitting on the tracks waiting to get run over uh, with all these things coming down the pipe. And some people of you on the uh, call here might say, well, I'm a cosmetic surgeon, you know, so that doesn't apply to me. I'm immune to the oncoming train. But that's actually not entirely true. You're going to need these codes and practice data, et cetera, for your board certification, for maintenance of certification. Uh, hospitals often require these codes, uh, even if you just have transfer agreements, uh, if you're cosmetic only. Um, your operating room certification sometimes require these codes, um, and they're quite detailed, as well as if you have a certificate of need for your operating room. Also, if you have call responsibilities, unless you understand ICD-10, you're not going to be able to bill for any procedures you get on call. There are also a lot of blurred lines between procedures in plastic surgery, as you know, uh, breast reduction, rhinoplasty. These are things that could be sometimes cosmetic and sometimes are insurance-based. Also, back in 2007, when we had an economic downturn, uh, a lot of surgeons who were entirely cosmetic found themselves now taking call or trying to do insurance cases. Uh, if this does happen again in the future and life being cyclical, it probably will eventually. Uh, if you wait to then to try and uh, solve these problems with ICD-10 and these other uh, issues with coding and making sure that your practice is ready for the future, it will be too late when that time comes. And, you know, paper can get you around and some of the other EMRs out there there can get you around sort of like an Oldsmobile, but this sort of is a Tesla world. Um, things have changed and you need to be prepared in the future and plastic surgeons, we like to be on the cutting edge of things. So this sometimes appears like a zero-sum game. Um, nobody wants to see these com things coming down the pike, but we are all faced with them. So you can try and save money on ICD-10 implementation, but you're going to spend extra time filling out your super bills. Or to try and avoid the PQRS penalty, uh, you could spend an extra three weeks putting in the data that we're going to show you how you don't have to do that. Or to try and avoid the denials for the 2.5 and 5.9 modifiers, you could have to hire a billing consultant to check each one. Or you can end up paying, spending $100,000 or more for the wrong EHR, which is going to end up slowing you down, and it doesn't have to do that. So it sort of seems like pick your poison. 
you can choose what you're going to lose, time, money, or have to hire extra staff to take care of these things. But we'd like to show you how you can actually change the rules of the game um, uh, using opportunities uh, like these to turn what could be a revenue killer into actually a revenue opportunity. Uh, what you're going to do is leverage automation to take the things you're already doing in excellent documentation of your patient visits and turn those into efficiencies to eliminate penalties and reduce extra staff effort, thereby avoiding the zero-sum game here. So let's talk first about ICD-10 a little bit. So ICD-9, why does ICD-9 work on paper and why can most people use paper or a more simplistic EMR? Well, the top 50 ICD-9 codes fit pretty nicely onto a super bill. There's only 13,000 ICD-9 codes and most of the ICD-9 codes as plastic surgeons we know. We, you know, we all know that 611.1 is uh, macromastia, that 174.8 is a general uh, code for breast cancer, 238.2 is a lesion of undetermined etiology. We can memorize these like zip codes or PIN numbers, but ICD-10 changes that game. There are over 68,000 ICD-10 codes. They go up to, 60, up to seven characters and they are very, very detailed. So while your ICD-9 superbill may take you 20 to second, 30 seconds to fill out, an ICD-10 superbill is going to be virtually impossible. This is actually come October 2015, your simple superbill could look something like this. Uh, I hope you brought your loops because there are an innumerable amount of diagnoses you're going to have on here. Even you can see the little part we blew up, up basal cell carcinoma of the right eyelid is a completely different code from basal cell carcinoma of the left eyelid and you must identify laterality in ICD-10. And then the error rate if you try and do this manually is going to be enormous because again some of these codes have up to seven digits and there's a mixture of numbers and letters and if you get the code wrong you're not going to get paid. So if you don't have an ICD-10 solution we estimate it's going to take you between two and five minutes per super bill in the future. Uh, CMS has estimated that even small practices are going to lose between fifty and hundred thousand dollars in revenue either through increased denials or increased costs and lost productivity. Uh, the AMA did a study and estimated the number to be at least fifty six thousand dollars for practices that are preparing to implement ICD-10. So everyone agrees there's potential substantial costs. Also starting in 2017 rather there are going to be substantial penalties for not um, uh, taking care of ICD-10 and these other measures. So one of the options that a lot of our competitors are relying on are called crosswalks. So ICD-9 is easy, uh, at least pretty much so. There are uh, one code that maps to one diagnosis. Here you can see the code 949.2 though, which is a, a code for a bird. It's a general code for a bird. Now what this crosswalk tells you is this should map to T30.0 which is an unspecified body region, unspecified degree bird. If you put that down, you're not only going to not get paid, but if you have a patient who has a burn of their thigh, chest, and abdomen, the codes you should be using are these, the T24.211, the T21.21 or 22. Um, oh, by the way, you have all these X codes that have to follow that to determine how this occurs, and it's different if it's a stove, if it's hot cooking oil that was on the stove, it was, if it was the saucepan that the hot cooking oil was in, oh yeah, it's even different if it's a toaster. So there's not going to be any possible way you can memorize all these. Um, or you can go rely on your um, uh, books and if you decide to use a book, this is what you're going to get. You can see that the codes on an infection get very detailed down on here on the right to the offending organism. And you have to specifically know that certain infection subtypes have totally different codes. Oh, and the average one of these books has about 1,100 pages, and they pretty much all look like this. Also, there is something called code first. So you have to sometimes perceive the code you want to use with a different code. So you need to code the medical surveillance following a completed treatment, which is Z.08, before you put in history of non-melanoma skin cancer or history of melanoma skin cancer or again 
you're not going to get paid properly. So Dr. Sherling is going to do a uh, brief ICD-10 demonstration for you to show you some of this. So here I have a patient, Barbara Hinkle, who presents to us pre-October 1, 2015, and I'll show you what her note looks like. A pretty standard note, we have a second degree burn like Drew just showed. We have a laceration, which happens often that we have to repair. We have a basal cell carcinoma that maybe we're doing a consult on, and a history of non-melanoma skin cancer. Four diagnoses, pretty straightforward. We live in ICD-9, we can memorize those codes. Now, a system that isn't like Emma, that doesn't have native ICD-10 built in, you'll have to rely on the crosswalks that Drew just showed you, which could take up to three to five minutes it could take longer than documenting your notes. But to show you that Emma has all this built in, the only thing I need to do as a plastic surgeon is just change the date and everything else will follow. And I'll show you. So here it is. This date is March 3rd, 2015 today. And I'll just change it to 2016. That's the only change that I need to make to prove the point. Now, your documentation has to match your bill because if you're audited, you need to know that same burn picks up all of the metadata from the body location and registers not one code, but three codes. It also picks up the associated diagnosis, whether it was a hot stove or a hot oil. Here you can see the different lacerations based on body location and laterality. And skin cancers also are not just eyelid like they are in ICD-9 or arm or leg like they are in ICD-9, but they also have laterality as well and different subtypes. There is no more non-melanoma skin cancer. There's a Merkel cell, there's a basal cell, there's a squamous cell, there's a sebaceous carcinoma. All of these have their own unique codes. And here you can see a history of non-melanoma skin cancer needs to be preceded by the personal history of other malignant neoplasm of skin. So instead of four codes, you actually have 14. So here you can see that Emma automates all of these codes it knows the seventh digit extension. It knows that since this is the first time they've ever been seen for a burn, it gets an A code. And then the next time they come in, it gets a D code. This is not something you don't have to worry about. Here are these, um, the, the contact with hot stove from the burn. And here is the encounter for the follow-up examination uh, after completion with the personal history uh, of, the, of the skin cancer in the correct order. So just to show you how easy it is to do this, the only thing I need to do literally is just pick a diagnosis. And here we'll just pick, um, uh, I'll just do insect bite just for, uh, just, just to demonstrate. This could have been laceration, this could have been anything. But if I just click here, wherever this is, it will pick up the body location and the ICD codes. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know anything else. And in real time, it picks them up. So that's it. That's ICD-10. The best type of technology is one you don't have to use. We don't need to know how it works. We just want it to work. And that's exactly what Emma Plastic Surgery does. So um, you, you can see Emma automates the ICD-10. It saves you time, money, and staff effort. These are things you're already doing um, or should be doing to document your, uh, your visits correctly. And you're leveraging that work you're already doing to create good medical documents documentation into getting paid properly if you go through this. So let's talk about meaningful use. That's another potential revenue killer. Um, there's a lot of pushback from people using stage two this year saying how um, it really decreases efficiency that's very onerous. Um, yet there's a disconnect. I think the ONC is touting how many people are, are testing for meaningful use and are meaningful users. Let's dive into the data just to see where we are. So using the ONC data from February of 2015, we can see that 93% of physicians are live on some sort of EHR. But if we dive deeper, only 75% of them are demonstrating meaningful use. And if we look at specialists, it's even less. So here, 50% of specialists, like plastic surgeons, are using a certified EHR and getting meaningful use. But if we look again at private practice, um, we even see it's lower. So here, 27% are using meaningful use. Um, and there's a reason why. Stage two is a little bit more onerous than stage one. Of 537,000 eligible providers, uh, only 24,000 are doing stage, uh, a portion of stage two, and of that, only 60% are doing stage two. So 10% of the eligible providers, of really who should be to have 250,000 providers, are actually doing it. 
And if we dive deeper, um, the, the, the actual um, EHRs that are, that are certified are even lower than the rate they're reporting. And, and the, the people that are getting their money from meaningful use is about 50%. So there is a disconnect between people who are using and people who are actually successfully attesting. And not all products um, are equal in this regard. So let's talk about what we stand to lose. So for, for those of us that are doing insurance-based, um, you know, we, we bill a lot of Medicare with our surgeries. If we don't, are mean, if we're not meaningful users in this year, 2015, we get penalized two years from now, 3%. So that's 3% of our hard-earned Medicare uh, dollars just because of meaningful use. A CMS has recognized that there's uh, increasing complexity to stage two, and they are considering shortening the reporting period from one year to three months. Um, we expect this to be confirmed uh, this month. Um, we can check the CMS.gov website in the coming weeks. This is a huge opportunity for those of you that are on an EHR that isn't working for you to switch to EMMA so that you're not penalized. You don't have to be using something that doesn't work for an entire year. You can, you can switch as long as you're attesting for three months. So a huge opportunity to switch. So talking about pick your poison, yes, stage two is more time consuming than stage one. Um, yes, there's a, a penalty if, you, if, you, if you're billing $500,000 in Medicare um, then that's $15,000 of penalty in 2017 for not doing it this year, and obviously um, an increase in staff as well. Um, and so uh, there, there, there are reasons not to do it, um, but we have a very good track record, and with CMS uh, lowering the window from one year to three months, the ROI then becomes there. We also offer services on top of our platform uh, called Meaningful Use Safeguard. While statistically speaking, specialists are only 50% successful in attesting for meaningful use, our safeguard services have over a 95% success rate. So again, that is uh, something that a lot of our users do do. You have a, a, a certified meaningful use expert that you can e that send unlimited emails that, that meets uh, over the phone with you uh, at least once a month, going over your meaningful use report, making sure that you're in good shape. Um, so, so that's meaningful use. Let's talk a little bit about PQRS. PQRS stands for Physician Quality Reporting System. Uh, it is it is being used uh, as a way to, to measure quality and in some cases reduce um, extra expenses. There's a big change this year for PQRS. Uh, this year, P P PQRS becomes pay for performance. That means it matters how you perform. And in this case, it goes to nine measures in three domains with greater than 50% of your Medicare Part B patients. And one measure has to be a cost-cutting measure. This is very onerous for any physician that sees Medicare patients. Nine measures is a lot of measures. It's a lot of documentation. Without the right system that can automate much of this, um, it could be a, very, a big efficiency uh, uh, or a time suck. Um, so, so again, the penalty for non-PQRS participation has increased as well. So in 2015, if practices don't participate in PQRS, there is a 2% penalty for PQRS, and there's an additional 2 to 4% penalty to the value-based modifier because PQRS is linked to the value-based modifier, which we'll get to. So the total, uh, a, a small practice stands to lose 4% of Medicare revenue for non-PQRS participation. A large practice that's 10 or more stands to lose 6% of Medicare uh, revenues uh, for non-participation in 2015 delivered in 2017. So examples of a cross-cutting measure, I just quickly, um, we have CART medications in the Medicare medication record and preventative care and screening for tobacco cessation. These are part of uh, meaningful use and uh, we get these ones pretty easily through our structured data, which we're about to show. Uh, how do unstructured EHRs do it? They do it this way. Lots of yes, no questions. So for one PQRS measure around melanoma, you have to answer approximately 20 yes, no questions. And if you do the math on this, nine measures, 10 to 20 yes, no questions, anywhere from one to 5,000 patients, that's about 125,000 yes, no questions for the year. That's about two to three works of data entry for somebody whether that's a doctor, a physician assistant, an office manager, or a medical assistant. That's a lot of money that someone's paying somebody else to fill in. So you lose it some way unless you have a system that can automate much of it. So again, pick your poison. PQRS is going from three measures to nine this year, from pay for reporting to pay for performance, two to three weeks of data entry per provider, four to six percent of Medicare revenues, and lots of people being paid to put it all in. In. There's got to be a better way, and I'm about to show it to you. Okay. So what I want to show you is the power of structured data. 
our system automatically knows who is Medicare and who is not Medicare, so you never have to worry about answering that question ever. I want to show you a very simple note, an incomplete note, just to show you the power of structured data. Modernizing medicine can read text, understanding the barcoding underneath it. So, so the structured data that we have is barcoded, so we know what things apply for what measures. We know if the patient's a non-smoker to qualify you for PQRS. We know if your medications are put in a certain way to qualify you for the current medication. And we also know if it's flu season or not, if the patient's greater than 65 or not. There are lots of different measures that plastic surgeons can have without having to worry about it. I'll show you our PQRS system, which knows that this patient who has virtually nothing in their note is already qualifying for eight measures by just the time of year and by what's in their note. So here it knows, uh, literally, that the patient's a non-smoker, so you already get credit for this cross-cutting measure. It knows that the patient has current medications documented, so you don't have to worry about it. And there are other measures as well that it picks up because it, um, it's here and because um, you have like different things like pain assessment and the patient's older than 65, so we know there's a pneumovax. Now, these things don't necessarily apply to plastic surgeons, but I'll tell you what does. The three melanoma measures, which is about to grow to four. Um, the, uh, there's different uh, surgical ones as well, uh, which you can use like functional assessment if you have uh, a hand practice or something like that. And so there's probably about six of them that are really easy to get to, and then a couple that don't apply to all of your patients, um, where you can have a high performance rate without having to hire somebody for three weeks, without having to just um, accept the fact that you're going to lose 2 to 4% of your Medicare revenue. So a really nice system. This automatically um, tabulates visits across all of your patients for the year that then can be submitted to a registry so that you get uh, your, uh, your, to avoid the penalty. That's the way to do PQRS. It's not to rely on double entering in your notes and double entering in your quality measures. And as we'll see with the value-based modifier, this is going to become a much bigger part of how we practice. So again, this just shows you what we just, which I just demonstrated, that it, it automates much of the, all of the denominator information and much of the uh, numerator for some select measures uh, to really reduce the time spent putting it in, which makes the ROI worth it. Let's talk a little bit about the value-based payment modifier. This is new. Um, the value-based payment modifier is a way of, uh, uh, it's basically the Robin Hood of, of CMS, and it takes money away from people who don't do PQRS or who have a higher cost uh, per Medicare uh, expenditure and gives it to people who do do PQRS. Um, so this is part of the target Medicare uh, goal uh, to, to, to assign fee-for-service to quality. And don't worry about the dark blue. This dark blue of alternative payment models really affects um, the ACO model, ho acute hospitalizations, uh, and stage renal disease, that's not plastic surgery. What you want to focus on is the light blue, where in 2016, 85% of Medicare fee-for-service ties to quality, and in 2018, 90%. How they are going to do this for our surgical subspecialties is through PQRS and the value-based modifier. So let's talk about it. So the value-based modifier is an increase or decrease in quality tiering that combines a quality measure composite score with a cost measure composite score to assign you to one of three tiers. So if you have a higher performance in PQRS, you can actually get a Medicare fee-for-service rate increase. If you are average uh, performance on PQRS, you get a neutral effect. And if you participate in PQRS and you're in large practice, you can actually get below the national mean of a rate reduction on how you perform. Now, the rate reduction only applies to practices that are 10 or more. So most plastic surgery practices that are less than that they get none of the downside so long as you participate in PQRS and all of the upside if you have a performance. So you can only win if you participate in PQRS. If you don't play, you automatically get things 4% uh, for a small practice and 6% for a large practice. So here again, what you do this year determines how you get paid in 2017. Doctors in one to nine groups get none of the downside so long as they participate in PQRS and all of the upside of the value-based modifier meaning if you perform high, you get a rate increase. Groups of greater than 10, even if you do participate, you get subject to upward neutral or downward payment adjustment depending upon how you perform. And here's where some of you can ruin it for others. So in a big group, 
If less than 50% of you participate in PQRS, everybody in that group gets penalized. So you need you need a forum, you need uh, greater than 50% of your group to participate in PQRS if you're in a large group. Here's that Robin Hood uh, graph. So here you can see um, for larger groups, those with low quality and high cost get penalized. They take that revenue and give it to the doctors with relatively lower average cost with high quality. High quality meaning PQRS performance. Here you can see lower, um, uh, sorry, providers in one to nine uh, cohorts um, that have none of the downside if they have high cost. As long as they participate in PQRS, you're okay. Um, and here you can get the benefit of the uh, rate increase if you have a high quality uh, performance on PQRS. So that's, that's PQRS and the value-based modifier. Um, I'm going to jump back in to talk a little bit about modifiers in general. So I know I mentioned earlier about the use of the 2.5 and the 5.9 modifiers. Um, once I ICD-9 is gone, those modifiers are gone as well. Um, and actually, there's going to be an interim step with other modifiers that I'm not going to talk too much about, but actually, Emma can handle those for you as well. Um, but the 2.5 and the 5.9 modifiers um, uh, are going to basically lead to possibly uh, denials um, or records requests, which we all know cost us time and thereby money um, and delay on payment. Um, and a, they even can lead to audits, or if you really are abusive of them, uh, even jail, uh, if they uh, actually come after you to think that you're abusing the 2.5 and the 5.9 modifiers to try and get payments on things that you probably shouldn't be getting. And Emma knows where you're supposed to be using these and where it's okay and where you're not. So, for instance, say a patient presents for a biopsy of suspicious lesion on the cheek. If you only look at the cheek and nothing else, you can't use that 2.5 modifier um, for the rest of your visit that day. However, Emma will lead you and tell you if there are other things um, that you could do that day that you uh, will tell you you need a few more things, you can possibly bill for something and use a 2.5 modifier. Same thing with a patient with a laceration. If, you're, uh, if you repair a laceration and your exam is focused on laceration, you cannot use the 2.5 modifier that day. Um, you have to have something that is separate and identifiable. But for instance, if you do have a patient, say you're doing a Mohs reconstruction on a patient, and you specifically talk to them about sunscreen use and skin and stuff like that, then you can use a 2.5 modifier and Emma will know that. Uh, talk a little bit about medical necessity too. Um, it's going to be required that you actually document the medical necessity while you do, where you do things. And I think a great example of this is a, um, is a Mohs repair. Uh, the uh, Emma will specifically prompt you why a higher level of reconstruction was performed, provide suggestions, and here you can actually see a screenshot. If you decide to do a Mohs repair instead of doing a straight line repair, a simple repair, you could do either an intermediate or complex uh, repair or a flap and a graft. It will give you options to choose that will serve as documenting medical necessity for you to actually justify billing for that higher level repair. Let's talk a little bit about telemedicine. <clears throat> telemedicine is, is, is coming to us. There, in October of 2014, there was a final rule which created a CPT code uh, that would cover remote patient monitoring of chronic conditions. And we, adapt, we estimate that uh, mobile health will be about a $27 billion industry in 2017, and there are already telemedicine companies that are out there today that have physicians that I have hired to compete for your patients from afar. And so we thought it was really important for our user base to have a telemedicine app that they could really give to their patients uh, to really, um, really generate revenue for, for them. And we, we are building a telemedicine app. We expect it to be ready Q3, Q4 of this year, and we'll kind of highlight some of its features. So it's an asynchronous mobile application. It will be available both on the iOS and Android-based devices. We anticipate launch Q3, Q4 of 2015. Uh, we, we, we think uh, uses could be uh, for post-op uh, care, for wound, for wound uh, medicine and management. We think it will be the perfect tool for and obviously for keeping in touch uh, with uh, cosmetic uh, patients and maybe even lead gen. Um, so here, basically, uh, the easy login reporting. We can create uh, new visits and follow-up cases, look at um, different reasons for visits. This is a little bit more dermatology-focused, but really could be extensible to anything for plastic surgery. Uh, patients can take pictures of lesions or concerns and then generate uh, a, a profile with photos that can then be sent to the physician 
and there can be an interaction between the physicians and uh, the patients and then submit the case. Uh, the case can be uh, really evaluative. Um, so let's say the patient is a, a wound care patient that you need to refill in the prescription on, so they never have to go into your office. And if you think about that, that's great for them because they have the convenience of being seen in their own uh, in their, in their own home. Uh, and for really the essentially uh, the price of a copay, um, get a lot more convenience, and then you have a way of really interacting with your patient and getting compensated for it. Um, so wanted to just show you just a, a lot of the ways that modernizing medicine is different than systems that are out there today, and there are really three pillars. Uh, the first is the fact that we're cloud. We're scalable, we're searchable, we're reliable. We give updates every month that are incorporated in the monthly, the monthly subscription, so we are true cloud. Uh, we are mobile. Uh, we have a certified iPad uh, app for meaningful use. We have native Android and, and iOS devices for pocket use by physicians while they're on call. And we're developing a patient mobile app uh, that will be ready, obviously, towards the end of this year. That's a huge differentiator for us. It means it's workflow friendly. You're not tethered to a desktop. You're not typing a lot. It's touch, and it goes wherever you are. And the final thing is we're, we capture structured data. And with structured data, there's intelligence. And so uh, capturing this data allows us to compute uh, ICD-10 codes that are complex, allows us to compute PQRS and quality measures without having to double enter them in. And these types of things, as documentation become more onerous over time, really save the physician uh, from losing time, which is money, or paying their staff to enter things in. And that's really what makes modernizing medicine uh, us. So don't get fooled by false choices. ICD-10, you're going to pay for it one way or the other, whether it's reduced revenue from denials, whether it's increased time because you weren't trained, or whether you're really delegating to other people that you then have to pay. Don't get fooled by meaningful use. Stage 2 is a lot more onerous than 1, and, and you're paying for it whether you pay for the penalty or whether you have other people put it in for you. The PQRS and the VBM modifiers are steep between four and six percent penalty. If you don't pay for it in penalty, you'll pay for it in data entry or in making other people do it and paying them over time. Modifiers, um, there's definitely an increased scrutiny on the 25 modifier and the 59 modifier that could result in denials, which slows down your documentation because you have to not overuse it but use it in the right way um, with these new X modifiers that are coming out and uh, relying on a biller to place it for you in the correct way. And telemedicine, obviously, firms competing for your patients. So the right way to solve this problem is not to lose in revenue, lose time, or lose in staff. It's to pick a technology solution that can automate uh, or offer new products and services. So automating ICD-10 solves the, the pick your poison for, uh, choice here, simplifying meaningful use, uh, CMS shortening the reporting period and offering services to help you through, automating much of the PQRS, and measuring quality is important in this new paradigm of value-based medicine over volume-based medicine, and then automating uh, modifiers, the correct placement of the modifiers so that you can build with confidence and then offering a revenue generating opportunity through telemedicine. That's what differentiates us. That's what makes us different. And we're really excited to speak with you. And with that, um, we'll open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions, feel free to, uh, under the question box, uh, type in any questions that you may have. So the first question that we're getting is are, are you really sure that ICD-10 is going to happen this year? And we, de we definitely get that one a lot. And we have checked with the AMA. We've checked with CMS. We've checked with the uh, Academy Societies. And we all believe that it's actually going to happen this year, October 1, 2015. I think this year, hospitals are ready. Many practices say they're ready. Many vendors claim they're ready. But we, what we have shown you is that it's, it's the only thing that will give you confidence is to show you a solution that actually works, and our ICD-10 solution has been working for the last year. And so it's out there already, it's ready, and that should give you confidence that it's going to happen. So somebody asked, is Emma a complete, pro, uh, complete practice management system? I use Nextech. Will Emma replace Nextech? So Emma has a lot of things that are different. Um, so it has EHR, it's certified, it has mobile technology. Uh, we're getting into newer um, uh, uh, programs, obviously, with, with built-in PQRS and, and uh, ICD-10 and things of that nature. Um, it, it today interfaces with over 200 practice management systems. 
Um, it is not one, uh, it is not, it does not have a practice management system today. We do offer RCM services focusing on plastic uh, surgery and dermatology. Uh, we, we have acquired a company that does that, that uh, that's, called, that's now Modernizing Medicine West based in California. And those that sign on with the RCM, we do provide a practice management system that does integrate with uh, Emma. For those of you that want a complete solution, we can offer that. And we also offer bi-directional interfaces uh, with uh, many, many practice management systems where the demographics and insurance come in and the charges go back. So for those of you that don't want to worry about ICD-10 at all and want that, those wonderful codes that we generate uh, natively to, to, to translate into the practice management system, we have those interfaces today. Great question. Someone asks uh, about the value-based modifier, if we could just uh, kind of restate what it is, why it is, why it's happening. Uh, so the value-based modifier is a modifier that is part of um, the, uh, the new um, uh, legislation that basically states that physicians need to uh, use physician quality reporting to avoid uh, penalties so that uh, we're all practice value-based medicine. So again, it, for this year, it affects everybody. So if we don't do PQRS, we'll get penalized at least 2%, sorry, at least 4% in 2017. Um, so somebody asks um, if one PM system is our main PM system that we do a bidirectional bridge with? Is that your most recommended system? Uh, we don't have one preferred system. We have a lot of offerings. Um, we, uh, the ones we do bidirectional with are Cario, AdvanceMD, Clinics, CareCloud, um, Athena Health, and there's several other ones as well. Um, so we recommend, um, we definitely have uh, lots of practices on all of them, and we can provide uh, physicians that you can talk with uh, to discuss uh, what they like about them. Some people are asking about data conversion. Um, if they're on a, an EHR system today um, you know, and they want to switch, is there a way to convert their data? Uh, we, we offer some, um, some ways of converting some of the data. Uh, because we are a very structured system, uh, many people can't, with high fidelity, transfer all of that data to us, uh, although we do have some third parties that can get you off of what you're on and, and, and capture um, some of the notes in PDF form and store them in a way that's accessible. Um, direct EHR to EHR migration is never completely clean. It's sometimes expensive, but we do have some solution if, you, if that's very important to you. Great question. Somebody asks, um, how else will Emma ha help a practice improve revenues if they have a higher percentage of cosmetics and insurance? and very minimal Medicare patient services to report quality measures. Sure. Um, so I'll take this uh, question. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a few different ways. But, you know, like I said, the, you know, patients expect you to be a high-end practice. They expect you to use a high-end solution. And, um, you know, having something that is, uh, you know, allows you on a mobile device to document and be very careful in your documentation and really show uh, people, you know, uh, you know, the level of medical record and the level of questions that help lead you down the line of the things you should be doing is very, very helpful. We also have drawing tools. You can actually import pictures into Emma. You can draw on those pictures and make them part of the medical record when you're demonstrating things that you're trying to do for patients. And they like that. There is also a patient portal that they can go on and uh, uh, fill out some of their information, things like that. And all these things play into uh, cosmetic practice. And I think the one big thing that also differentiates us is being a handheld. Uh, you know, previously in um, my practices, you know, when we worked off of uh, desktops or laptops, it really interfered with your interface with the patient. Just an iPad doesn't really stand between you and the patient in the same way. Uh, somebody asks, can a brand new physician write up school participate in meaningful use in PQRS? I've heard that it's too late. I believe that there is an exception uh, for 
Uh, so if you're um, if you were to graduate this year, I think there is an exception that you can uh, qualify for an exemption if you're right out of school, um, because by definition you have to be using it for your Medicare patients for greater than 50% of the year um, for PQRS. And if you're out by July 1, then you you can't. Um, so I, I do believe there is a way to report. Uh, there is some kind of grace period for avoiding a penalty if you're right out of school. Um, but uh, there is an opportunity um, uh, with, a, with the meaningful use only having a three-month reporting period, which we think uh, will be this year. Great question. So I think, you know, as medicine changes from, you know, uh, just writing a note, it's not writing a note anymore. It's, yes, you have to write your note, but you have to make sure that your note has the key elements in it to get paid, whether that's medical necessity, whether that's the right ICD codes, whether that's the right quality metrics, whether that's the right modifiers. That can slow you down and it can give you a, a sense of, 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 of worry that it, you, know, you didn't document enough or that you overbilled or that you didn't document the right amount. And Emma really has great coding technology built in uh, to, to document based on the body load to uh, render the correct ICD-10 co ICD code so you don't get a denial, to understand what codes are, are, are bundled in to a procedure code and not, uh, to understand you know, the excess modifier versus the site-specific modifier. And that affects plastic surgery. We also uh, have a dedication to mobility. We believe that that is the future. And there will be ways that you'll engage with your patients as plastic surgeons that you'll be able to do with this tool that the existing technology, because it's client server, that means that all of the data that you have is stuck on a computer somewhere and cannot be liquid if there's no data liquidity there. Um, that means you can't really engage with your patients. This, these apps, these patient apps that are coming on the pike down the line uh, will be downloadable from the iTunes store um, where patients can connect with you and, and, and send pictures to you and engage with you. And we think that is the future. And our platform can scale in that new paradigm much more easily than an older technology that's stuck on client server, that's a lot more expensive because you're paying for servers, when in reality we're physicians. We don't want to pay for all of these IT people to manage our practice, right? We want to manage it ourselves and we want it just, just to work. So with that, um, we, we thank you so much for joining. Uh, this, this, will, this webinar will be recorded and we'll forward it um, back to you if you want to share it with uh, one of your colleagues or an office manager and uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, we're really excited to answer any further questions that you may have around these uh, revenue opportunities um, with PQRS, ICD-10, Meaningful Use. And if you would like a demonstration, um, all you need to do is just go to our website, which is www modmed.com and you can just click on the request to demo and then just put in uh, obviously plastic surgery or cosmetic and uh, we'll be in touch thank you so much for your time we really appreciate it and we'll see you soon thank you everybody